All righty then. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the CS Leadership Roundtable. My name is Andrew Marks, co-founder of the Success Coaching Training Program. We are back for our monthly live leadership roundtable today discussing the psychology behind customer success. This free learning event is brought to you by Success Coaching, the world leader in customer success professional development training with more than 9,000 students globally on our platform and more than 6,000 certifications uh, that have been issued. Our training programs are available as self-paced online learning, virtual instructor-led boot camps, and a hybrid 12-week live coaching program. We offer a number of standalone courses taught by industry experts, including data-driven decision-making, having difficult conversations, and change management for customer success. We'll also be rolling out the first level of our certified customer success leadership training track in the coming months. You can find out more about our training programs at successcoaching.co, and Ashley is going to drop a link in the chat for those of you who want to just click on the link. Now, for those of you who haven't participated in one of these before, this is a live and unscripted discussion where we dig into a single topic that is relevant to customer success leaders. Regardless of the company that you work for, the scope of your role, or the sizes of the customers your team deals with, we aim to pick topics that are going to be practical and useful to you. Uh, we're working on our CSLR schedule for next year, so I encourage you to suggest topics and guests for our program. Reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn and drop me a note, and I believe Ashley is going to also drop a link in the chat right now if you have any ideas. The schedule for our upcoming CS Leadership Roundtable events through the end of the year can also be found at successcoaching.co under the events tab. As usual, we'll post a replay of this webinar along with a transcription of it early next week on our website. Now, there's a lot of thought leadership out there along with a lot of theories about how to deliver customer success. This series allows us to focus on the practical, real-world advice, best practices, techniques, and shared experiences from those practicing and leading customer success teams on a daily basis. And to do that, we invite three panelists to join me for a roundtable discussion. These are people who are great at their craft, and we ask them to share their experiences and their perspectives. We will be taking questions later on during the webinar, so please use that Q&A button found at the bottom of your screen to ask or upvote a question. Also, please keep all commentary to the chat window. So without further ado, I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves to y'all, talk a bit about who they are and what they do. And as usual in alphabetical order, let's start with Josh. And Josh, congrats on making the top 100 list this year. Hey, thank you so much. Uh... <laughs> All right, thanks. So, greetings. I am um, I'm Josh Rosenthal. I am the uh, the co-founder of CloudSploit, which was an open source cloud security uh, tool, which we brought from uh, concept through exit um, via customer success. So, we did not have a a sales force, um, and uh, we just used a lot of automation to figure out, as I call it, which which of the cattle are actually pets and uh, then go and figure out how to spend human time on them. Um, just to make sure I do this little call, out, I just want to kind of flag that, that these are thoughts are my own. Uh, you know, um, CloudSplate has been uh, purchased by Aqua Security. So thoughts of my own, just not representing a, a company or a product, just here to talk customer success. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Now on to Laura. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm Laura Laquara. I'm a senior manager of customer success for UiPath. We are robotic process automation. So we're automating things on your laptop desktop. And so um, seven years have been in robotics and automation. So very excited about this topic because one thing automation isn't doing fully yet is the psychology of everything and the understanding that we bring in customer success. So very excited to be here today and um, share some thoughts on um, how best to influence um, at our customers. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. That's actually, you know, there's, there's always going to be a need for a human element. Yeah. Right. Automation can only go so far. Uh, and I love automating. I think it's, it's an important part of scaling, you know, building a scalable CS business. Uh, but yeah, automation only goes far. So Laura, thank you. Last but not least, Mike. Hey there. Um, so yeah, I'm Mike Merritt. I'm the vice president of customer success for Planet. Um, I think I've been building customer success teams for just over 10 years now. And I kind of took the the hard road of 
three different, very different industries. So started in software defined networking, kind of the IT side of things, then to internet of things, and now moved on to space slash remote sensing. Um, and for me, the, the benefit of doing that is as you move across industries, you start to find these commonalities that work and, and the questions to ask to tailor fit that customer success solution to drive value. So excited to talk about this today. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. And thanks to you all for making time for us today. Uh, now let's get to the topic at hand. Uh, during our prep call, we talked about three different perspectives we could discuss during this webinar. The psychology behind getting key stakeholders engaged and successful on your product. The psychology behind the confidence of making suggestions as a customer success manager to make customers successful. And the psychology behind getting end users to adopt your solution. So... And we, we, we tried to figure out where we should start. How, how about we start with the psychology of getting stakeholders engaged and why that's so important? Well, what I think it comes down to, I'll get started here, is I'm coming from large enterprise um, engagements and strategic accounts. And it's taking, whether it's yourself, whether you're managing a team, obviously building those relationships through the handoff from sales and what those incentives are for those individuals and asking those questions. And one of my favorite, just let's get into tactics right away, is how do you leverage your company? If you're, you're a small company, how do you leverage the people within your company um, to actually add that value? Is it messaging that they need? Is it um, executive exposure? Is it product and, and being able to help with roadmap, depending on the roles that you're engaging with and what level you're at. I really believe in the power of team. And right now, it just so happens that we're five to 10 people on any given customer call that are really pinpointing and building relationships so that it's going across. We're looking at your key, stay, key stakeholder, but then also other people within at the same level. And then we're leveraging our executives or our product leads to actually go up the chain. But let me pass it to Mike and Josh. Yeah, I think it, it's kind of funny. Your, uh, your friend, uh, Jen, actually is building out a team of specialists to try and drive that same behavior, right? The value architect role, for example, the industry specialist uh, role, right? so that you could talk to the right stakeholders on their side. And then I think the other key thing is asking these really audacious, challenging questions, at least where you can play, where you have the credibility to ask them. We just did an executive business review um, last Friday, and really the whole time was spent asking questions. Like we had a whole presentation, and pretty much the entire time was just asking questions, hard questions about their business. And it got to the point where there was definitely some customer tension in that, but we were engaging all the different stakeholders around the, the room, starting with the, the senior level exec there. You're, you're flagging something tacitly, which is that that executive uh, review is not only a, an opportunity to review, as the name would lead you to believe, but is also an opportunity to sell up because you have that ability to engage that executive, whomever else is, uh, is in that room, as well as, as you already pointed out, better understand your, your users, including not only their goals, but their personalities and the things that will drive value for them. You know, it's, it's not always a simple business outcome. Well, and the other thing that I think, just, just to add one more thing that you get from that is, is you ensure there's alignment. Right. Yeah. A key stakeholder may have brought in a solution to address something that they're thinking about at their level. Right. But these other stakeholders down the chain don't necessarily either don't see that same perspective because they don't see the they don't have the executive, the senior executive's worldview. Right. Uh, and, and so what it does is it, it ensures alignment. Is everybody aligned here? Are we all on the bus faced in the right direction? Yeah. Somebody asked the question, what, what's, what are some example of bold questions? Like, so like the typical questions you hear, right? you know, like what keeps you up at night? You know, how do you measure success? What does success mean for you? Uh, one of the, my favorites though, is especially with the, the exact is, Hey, what does failure look like here? Mm -hmm. Tell me what it looks like 
if we disappoint, if we fail here, what, what does that look like? And by doing that, it gets them to articulate what success looks like, right? Because a lot of them actually haven't really gone deep into what success looks like, but they, they cut you a check, right? Like, what does failure look like? How are we going to disappoint you so we can avoid that? And taking that kind of worst case scenario approach can kind of spur that emotional response that you need to get engagement. By the way, Mike, what a fantastic use of the apathism, right? It's like we can't define like what is, so we're going to go and define what isn't. The, what isn't the right. opposite of that. Yeah. You know, see, I, I take that a step. I I, I love that. I, I a, that's a what is failure. I I love that. I think it's it's really important, right? Um, uh, but but I actually take take it take it back a step and say forget forget about this solution forget about what we're talking about how are you measured yes right yes. so I want to play to I want to figure out is there a way that I can take what we do and connect it to one of your own personal objectives that's that's likely tied into corporate objectives at the, you know objectives at the corporate level. Right. Then I'm really playing an ego card there. I'm playing a, you know, for a, especially for a leader who's probably got a growth mindset. I'm playing right into that. Well, and Andrew, I'd argue you can do that to every person you are engaging with. It's at the end user yeah. because we've got to have that alignment and everyone's incentivized by their, let's face it, by our bonuses, by our reviews and the KPIs that were hit. And so when you're talking, whether it's a, the project manager, whether it's the end user, like I said, or the executive, they're going to have KPIs. And we are one of many initiatives and solutions that are in their wheelhouse that they're needing to deliver on. I 100% and- agree. But if there was one, if there was only one person that you could do that with, who would you do it with? You do it with that senior executive. And the reason sure. why you do it with that senior executive is who is going to be responsible internally to help you drive adoption. Because you as a vendor are not going to drive adoption. What you are going to do is you're going to, you're going to enable right. your, your customer, your key stakeholders to drive adoption. So getting that person, that's the most important person to try and connect the dots with. Absolutely. But I agree with you. And we should talk about this, too, because we talked about in the prep call, we talked about the with them, right? The whole what's in it for me angle in driving adoption, which you want that executive to be on, you know, you know, on on the team for and and involved, heavily involved with. But it goes down to that end user. Right. So what's in it for me? Okay, there's a total ego play there. There's a total psychology play. I'm going to help you make your job easier. I'm going to help you. Whatever it is, whatever is in it for them. So I want to add to this, to this idea of talking to the person, talking to the executive. When I, when I engage a company, um, especially in the, uh, the enterprise space, I start to look at the, uh, the user, the manager, and the executive and try to speak to each of those. Now, in cybersecurity, I, I uh, had a, a background in application security, and people would always say, hey, you know, with this AppSec tool, you'll be able to, to write super secure code. Well, that would sound like the the goal of the uh, software developer using these tools. But what I did was I kind of wanted to get to the psychology behind that. And I realized that that's not really what the developer wanted. Now, sure enough, there were you know security-minded developers, and I don't want to take that away from anyone that is. But I realized that what they were really wanting to do was to write code that was secure enough that the security team wouldn't bring it back to them. They wanted to have a system secure enough that when they went to dinner, that they didn't have to get interrupted by a security event. Mm-hmm. So, so that's why I want to talk about the psychology behind this, because it's not just about the stated goals. It's also about the personal goals. Yes. And some, yeah. Yeah, contextualizing it, I think is really important. I think another way you can do that is to talk about others in their space and what they've done, how they've succeeded and failed. And because that they're always looking at what other people in the industry are doing and things like that. You got to be careful what you share, obviously, on that. But to the extent that you can, I think that's another way to just drive it home. Like, A, talk about that visual kind of pain that you'll 
receive. If you don't try and make it very tan tangible so that drive that emotional response and then be kind of talk about, look, you don't want to get left behind. You don't want to be this guy. You want to be this person here. Or a woman. Right, exactly. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> just, call out sorry, her. Mike. No, <laughs> All right. Just teasing. Um, <laughs> but to play devil's advocate for a second, um, Andrew and the entire team, I have had churn and things fail when you're not doing psychology across the board. Yes, that executive conversation, but sometimes the executive, depending on the sponsorship and engagement, I just, if we did not get the psychology or train the team right on the psychology of those that are PMing or in use, I've had things not, yeah. not end up in the extension, the renewal and things like that. And I'm, I'm curious, Mike, Josh, how, how do you manage those pieces or train your team to manage those pieces? Lack of executive engagement, you mean? like Or all the way up the funnel. Churn happens bottoms up. Churn happens tops down. Yeah, look, I mean, churn, churn's going to happen, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. But but that's our our jobs as as guardians, if you will, uh, of that revenue, right? Um, yeah. What are we doing? Because I think there's a there's a I, I think we've discussed before, like there's a, a change in customer success from defense, like hey, please uh, don't leave me, to offense. Right, which is you know increasing that um, net recurring revenue, and part of this is um, our our job as customer success managers wearing so many different hats, and part of that is marketer, part of that is a salesperson, yeah. and going and selling to the different personas: executive, manager, doer. So we only do this for like most of our strategic accounts, but in the past I've had a kind of wider footprint where. We'll do that risk assessment across the organization. And if you don't know where somebody sits, you just put them as a red, right? If they're not filling out your MPS, you're not engaging with them or they haven't, you don't actually have confirmation that they're a supporter. We flag them as a red. And then every quarter, that's an OKR thing for a CSM, which is like, it's, it's a CSM OKR, but it's really the account team's responsibility, right? It's that broader team, right? Maybe it's sales, maybe it's exec, maybe it's, you know, uh, technical, right? pairing those stakeholders like we talked about earlier and getting to those people, turning them into promoters or at least into yellow neutrals, right? That are not going to detract and, and, and kill this. That's how you mitigate that risk. And then getting that executive, not only to engage, but get the, the mind share so that they're vested yeah. in success. They feel like they want to put their personal reputation on the line for this because it's going to be a success if things go right and it's going to be a great success story for them yeah and, and you gotta and sometimes you just gotta spell that out for them even though they're the ones who pushed for the purchase maybe even signed signed the po whatever whatever you know it's coming out of their budget companies don't buy product to you know just for the sake of buying stuff they want to get value out of it and the key stakeholder that brought you in that executive stakeholder that brought you in is the one who needs that value. The you know, it's I went out on the limb and said, hey, let's bring these guys in. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna change us. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna impact the way we do things. Uh, and that that and sometimes you just gotta spell that out for them. Hey, you need to be engaged here. I need you here. I need you aware of what's going on and push and adoption and all this other stuff because it's your reputation internally. I'm just trying to make you look like the smartest person in this company for bringing us in. Exactly. And that actually buys you time sometimes if, if it takes a little bit longer to drive the change that you're looking for. It can buy you time, right? Because they want that win and they're willing to wait for it if need be. They, they, they do, for sure. Sometimes with a deployment, um, especially in a, in a complex engagement like the ones that we're discussing, I think of, uh, of Pavlov and his dog, right? It's that time to first value, right? Not time to full value. It's right. time. How do I get you the reward, that little treat in the dog's mouth as soon as possible? And sometimes that, that's opening to a, a, a ready, fire, aim approach where we're just getting started and able to go and get some value, have something that that person that, that you were just speaking to 
uh, Andrew, mm -hmm. say, hey, you know, we didn't get full value, but we, we already got X. Josh, yeah. one of my favorite things to do is during milestones, what is the emotion we want at the different stakeholder level to experience? And so how that manifested itself, I was used to working with a hardware product. Apple by far understood the unwrapping and the wow moment that you can have. You haven't even used the product. You've done nothing. And you're like, oh, you unbox. And there's this experience you feel emotionally. And so when I think about software um, and SaaS specifically, what does that feeling give when you first start? And then what does it start that feeling get when they start using more and adopting more? And then what is that feeling when you add new product features and updates? I feel like those there's these key milestone moments that can be so emotional, even though we're dealing with maybe some unsexy business and products, but they're solving a problem for our customers. And there's still, there's still moments of truth, right? They, they yeah. are moments where you make or break your relationship with that customer, right? We're actually, we're, we're dealing with humans, right? Yeah. And, we have, and this is one of the, the beautiful things about this conversation that we're having um, is, uh, I, I mean, I'm thinking that psychology is too often overlooked in, um, in our industry. Like we're, we're so focused on uh, data, this data-driven mindset, these metrics. Um, and the deeper I get into this, I've actually taken a, a sharp turn from metrics into psychology where, where my focus is at when I'm going and doing my own, you know, ponderings and readings. And, and you're talking to a guy with a master of science in operations research. So I'm into data, right? Um, but we're humans and we lead with our hearts and then we follow through with our heads. So we need to go in and, you know, kind of uh, touch them. Yeah, for sure. And, and have them, you know, touch them in the feels, right? Like have them feel it and well, then go and justify it. And you know what that win though, that early win is so important is it's about momentum. Yes. Like are people jumping on the ship to help you or are they jumping off the ship because they don't want to touch it? Yeah. Right. And like, if you can get that early win yeah. and like to your point where I like show like the unboxing experience, it's amazing. And even if it's just that first day of the relationship, wow, you know, this, this solution is really impressive already. I'm already really impressed people take notice and they're like, okay, I want to be involved in that project because it's going to be a successful showcase project. Right. And then you get the resources you need. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Totally. Total self-fulfilling prophecy. And this is why we'll, we'll side note here. Cause I see some people on the, the that are listening from, from, uh, from my, my uh, coaching cohort. Um, this is why it's so important onboarding is done well, that transition from sales to post sales and that the, the onboarding experience, because it, it very much a momentum thing. The last thing that you want is to show up and have to reset expectations. So you got to get that dialed in. Um, just a reminder, uh, you can ask questions. So, so please feel free to use the Q and a functionality at the bottom of the screen. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll take questions as soon as we see uh, the, the list really start to populate. So let's talk about, um, we, we talked about the psychology you know, behind the, the key stakeholders, all right? I think that we've, you know, it's all, it's, it's, it's an important element uh, of success. Let's kind of uh, switch gears here a, a bit and talk about kind of the psychology from the, from the customer success manager's perspective, right? Having that confidence, you know, of making suggestions or having those difficult conversations that sometimes you need to have uh, with your customers and telling them things that, uh, you know, things that they, they need to hear, not necessarily things that you think they want to hear. So from my perspective, customer success managers by default love helping. They love helping, right? And I think that often gets confused with being nice and being pleasant, you know, with with the customer, not, not aggravating the customer, of course, right? And there's a subtle shift um, and this is a training thing, right? And Andrew, I know your, your team hammers this home, which is you help by impacting. And it's really not help, it's impact. Yeah. And it's, it's just an evolution of help, right? But, but drawing that line, connecting those dots with a CSM can be tough. It actually takes a lot, a lot of role play and a lot of work. 
to, to do that. I don't know, Laura or Josh, if you have thoughts on that. Sure. Um, I'm a big fan of scripting and those that are on the meeting having very specific roles and even personalities in a meeting. Um, and why I bring that up is right now, very technical product. Oftentimes there is a laundry list. If you're working with platforms, um, you might have a laundry list of things that are outstanding. And every quarter or every monthly cadence where you might have executives on that, there's an incentive to say, wait, we're getting all this work done, but from your customer to say, but our, our vendor hasn't delivered all these things. And I always find that CSMs are struggling to like manage the fact that you've got to deal with and have opportunity for your client to vent, but when and how to find time for that, because they've got to up level it. Right. And so one of the things that I think is really interesting is how can you allow for the reality of things not being perfect and find space and time for that conversation, but not have that be center stage when it's a high profile conversation, one that's really important. And when you would actually, it's a win-win for you both to be showcasing the success and not highlighting everything that's wrong. So that's the way I approach that is actually partnering with the customer and saying, Hey, what about this agenda? What about this and how we're storytelling throughout this meeting? How does this feel to you? And I've actually been able to flip and have CSMs flip how they're running these meetings that can actually have a lot of risk to them when you're aligned into that. You know, one easy uh, way to add to the effectiveness of everything you just said um, is sometimes just to have pre-meetings. You know, yeah. recognizing that there's a little bit of, of politicking and, and alignment, as we've already you know, talked about in this uh, conversation, that needs to occur before you stand in front of the group to, to take some of the pressure off of this laundry list of things that can get done and find out what needs to get done. And yeah. I like celebrating. <laughs> but does that, but to, so in that situation, though, I mean, are you, have you sufficiently, if you've, del if you have delivered value, have you sufficiently disseminated that you've delivered value, right? Uh, you know, so are, is it, is it a matter of, are, are, are you, are you creating the situation, right? Because if we're, you know, part of what we need to do in customer success is, 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 yeah, we, we got to deliver that value, but then we got to make sure that people know that the value has been delivered, yeah. right? And if they know that the value has been delivered and we're constantly notifying them of the value that's being delivered and we're trying to push that out as far as possible, then does the, you know, do you mitigate the risk of being put in that position? Because yeah, yeah, there's stuff that's not done, but look at all this other stuff that we did do, right? And it's yeah. it, instead of, yeah, just trying to, no, I think angle. what I was going to jump in and say is how are you celebrating? Everything is through zoom. Everything's through email today or other forms. And so how are you presenting those wins throughout? And I think it takes more than just the meeting, um, obviously quarterly, or even if you get those, I mean, most, I think a lot of customers are tired of quarterly business reviews, if they're not adding enough value. But yes. that's the thing that when you recognize, when you create momentum for even rewarding your customers, when you're able to, as a company, highlight with certifications, with surveys, when you got to go beyond just product adoption and then the dollar value, even though that's what's going to be most important. Am I cost saving or am I growing revenue? But I think you have to think broadly on how you collect data and how you recognize throughout the different milestones, depending on how complex your product and experience is. Yeah, totally. And I think these conversations go back to the very first conversation you have where you're talking about what you're trying to visualize that success moment, right? What does success mean for you, right? And that's all you're focused on, right? What does that value? What does success mean? Okay, if we achieve that, what does that mean? How are we going to celebrate? How are we going to communicate? And some interesting ways that you can do that, like third-party validation sometimes, third-party awards and things like that, like support team awards or like innovation awards and things like that, having those in your bank, internal awards at their kind of like quarterly business reviews and things like that that they do. Or as Laura mentioned, like small things like badging and 
uh, even awards from your own company, right? We have our, our customer uh, innovation awards that I just presented yesterday. You know what I'm holding last, which I think is, is so important just to kind of look from the sales side is that we're actually talking past the sale. We're al allowing those users to go and envision life beyond the renewal, beyond the adoption, and to picture themselves getting that reward. And the reward could be, of course, improvement in the business process, as you already said, Laura, um, revenue growth, time savings. But it also can just be sometimes recognize the, the power of a trinket, right? And a t-shirt. Yeah. yeah. If you can get creative on those and do something that's really like impressive that people see it's visible, mm -hmm. be awesome. And this also ties back to why it's so important that we're tying customer desired outcomes, success criteria to corporate objectives. You want to make sure that that value is disseminated, that value is understood, that value is known. Uh, it, that's a pretty strong connection right there. Right, this, this is playing into what, we what our current focus is, the direction we're taking our organization. Yeah, exactly. Like, Checking out the analyst reports or the, the investor reports and, and things like that, if the company's public, is so critical. But otherwise, getting like their OKRs, their broad OKRs for the year, yeah. and which ones your particular team that you're working with is, is impacting most. I mean, it's okay to ask that question. Sometimes they won't share the specifics with you, but they'll give you, usually directionally, give you something on that one. Every time I meet with a CS leader who wants to talk to us about, our products, the first thing I ask them is, well, how are you measured? So I can start thinking about, okay, so I'm going to have, you know, you're measured by these, these are your four OKRs. Well, guess what? We're going to have an effect on OKRs number two, three, and four, that you, as you explained to me, and here's how, and I've built those connections in. Yeah. Right. I want, I want to have increased renewals. Well, you know, our training programs will, you know, give your people foundational, blah, 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 blah. That's going to, increase your renewal rate, right? So, you know, once again, spending the time, taking a step back, spending the time, understanding how these people are measured, how, how, how they think, how they're going to react, and then crafting a narrative around that, that, that is going to be very, you know, receptive to them, uh, all plays into your, the, the ultimate goal of getting them really engaged, right? Which is, which is what is critical to get, to get the, the, uh, your product adopted, right? Because we're changing the way people do things. And, and that leads to like the, to the last discussion theme, which is the psychology behind getting customers to adopt your solution, right? So understanding, understanding what they're with them is, the what's in it for me. And down at the end user level, Josh, you talked about approaching that at the, it, all these, you know, the different user personas, right? But <clears throat> these days, even more, than ever, especially now where every there's so much remote work. It's so important that we're getting down to, hey, you as an individual end user, help me understand, you know, what's important to you and how you work so I can craft a message that is going to resonate with you. Because it's not about the improved, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, lowered expense or improved income at the company level. It's what about for me? The, the work, the knowledge worker. I think, oh, sorry, Laura, did you want to go? Or, yeah. The, I think in that case, one of the things you have to be careful of is like, depending on how many end users you have, if it's, you know, more than 10, right? Like if you're not in control over it, that end user base is pretty large. Trying to work with your sponsor to actually produce like a video, for example, that you can work on together and you can contribute to that and you can actually even have a template for that handy that they they're they're just monitoring they're modifying we can add a logo on we can add a few things but that kind of thing where it's like scalable to x number of users it's ongoing and it kind of drives the exact messaging that you're looking for a series of them even i think is is a good easy way to go on these things Maybe a little bit uh, off topic, but I still in this idea of what's in it for me. Um, one thing that I've done in the past is going and creating 
template presentations to deliver to that customer. So that way your champion can go and take all of your words, yep. all of your graphics that showed value, et cetera, put it on their uh, company uh, template, put their name on it, 100% plagiarize as much as they want yep. mm-hmm. and you know have the opportunity to tell it your way, right? Um, as a way. Copy, presentations, communication pyramid, deployment strategy, a change management framework that you can just drag and drop right to the customer, make it make it as easy as possible for them to throw this stuff out, even sequences. Hey, do this first, then do make it prescriptive. Remember, we're dealing, we're we're likely dealing with senior executives that are looking at a lot of different things, right? And 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 if we want them, we want if we get them excited, we get we kind of tie the knot between between their objectives and what we can, what we can provide and help them achieve uh, anything that we can do to, to reduce the friction of them doing the things that we want them to do, but provide them with all those tools. Love that, Josh. That's, I, that, that's exactly what you want to be doing for sure. And it's one of the most common delays that you get from an adoption standpoint, right? Hey, we haven't put together the, the presentation that we need to do the training on. We haven't put the launch video together. We haven't done this. We haven't, you know, like if that little package, if, especially if your your solution is, you know, worthy and kind of repeatable of that, it's a great tool to invest in and get creative work on too. We do we do that. We do that with our our team subscribers, right? We have a very a predictable, repeatable, prescriptive approach. Do this, do this, do this, do this. Say this, say this, this. Say here's some email copy. Here are the things you need to, you know. And it's continuing to continuing to evolve it, right? That's the other thing is you want to yeah. make sure it's not it's not something that's static. You got to continue to evolve that sort of stuff. One thing, just as a thought, is that everyone's continuously selling. I, I know everyone has different responses to the the idea of sales, um, but we have to arm that the people that are customers are able to speak to what they're doing yes. and arm and be able to. So whether it's selling, whether it's storytelling, however you want to package that terminology, it's always the same. We want them to represent the best part of what we're partnering and doing together. And the only way to do that is really arm them with the repeatable practices, with the um, branding and messaging to be able to do that. Um, And so I think that's really one of the key pieces when we think about our own given roles and what we sell up and sell across of what impact we have and why we should have a job and why we should run teams. It's no different than the people that we're working with. Exactly. Yeah. We're, we're pushing on a concept um, that I, uh, I label as self-serving altruism, right? I mean, here, here I am, uh, Hey, end user, customer, whoever they are, the customer, I'm, I'm here to help you. Right. But for all of us that are at for-profit companies, um, you know, we also have a, a, a secondary goal in mind, but this creates the win-win. Yeah. Right. I'm able to go and do things to get you to your with them, uh, to your company's goals, OKRs, whatever it might be. Uh, but at the same time, I'm getting something from it. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the dream is proactive customer success. The dream is that we've already thought ahead. You don't even know what you know you need. So as a customer, so we're supposed to be creating the, the experience, the materials, the tools, whatever that is, yes. so that that is just laid out for you that you are coming through this experience together with us. And we've already decided that for you, you can give us feedback. We can customize it, it, you know, depending on the resources, but you've thought through, and that I think is what we're all trying to achieve at our companies is that proactive CS, which is so hard to get to. Yeah. And before somebody chimes in, we're not talking about creating or pushing the customer to our definition of success. These are just, we're talking about the tools, you know, that you use, the approaches that you take, right? You can still standardize on that. And some of the, even the, 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 um, automated things you can, you can still do all of that stuff and drive to a customer's definition of success. Let's, uh, so we we got two questions so far, but uh, let's let maybe 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 uh, we'll, we'll answer these questions and that will spur other questions. So um, our first one uh, comes from Alejandro. Alejandro asks, has anyone on the panel encountered 
customer fears, even signs of avoidance or anxiety associated with the customer journey. How do you address signs of anxiety from the customer? <clears throat> I'll tell you something. Screwing up the handoff from sales to post sales is a great way <laughs> to create fear for your customers. So, so do yourselves a favor. Make sure you got that nailed down. Um, but any, any, anybody have have any any experiences, any stories? I mean, look, every customer has fears, and one of your jobs is to find out what those fears are early on, right? As we were just talking about, like to get to the value and what is success. It's like, well, what are you afraid of? Like, yeah, what keeps you up at night? But what are you afraid of with this? Like, what's the worst case scenario? What are a few things that we can do to mitigate that? I think. There's two things though to keep in mind, right? So your job is to help mitigate those fears. One of the things you can do is then go above to the exact level to make sure to set proper expectations because you may well set those expectations uh, in a way that your primary stakeholder can't. And then there's a fine line at the end here. And this, this sounds a little controversial, but your worst case scenario is a customer that is too conservative to do the transformation required for their own success. And that's when you need to take a very nuanced approach mm. to finding other ways to move the ball forward yeah. and give them some air cover on that. Well, my, yeah. And my, my hope would be you would be figuring that out earlier in the customer journey. So you're not dealing with, with it at the end. I mean, it's kind of part of, Part of sniffing out, okay, what makes this person tick? Yeah, right. And it's a gatekeeper kind of persona yeah. that you can run into that can be a little dangerous, right? Yeah. Um, and it's okay to have a hard conversation with them or it's okay to leverage your full broader team to find other areas in the organization and then marshal it from there and and have generate a way that sweeps your customer up in it and they all succeed. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I think this is um, what you're alluding to, Mike and Andrew. Um, this is a company-wide problem. When you think about customer anxiety and fear, that starts with the sales and marketing and, and what we're setting the stage with. And so the sooner that as a company you grow and are really able to see those success stories and you're modeling out what are the resources, what are the needs of us as a company, what is the need of our customers to be able to deliver something, that's when you can start having answers to those concerns. That's when you can actually start setting those. Because I agree, Andrew, sometimes that is, it's really late in the stage if it's at hand up or more important once onboarding is complete, that all these concerns and anxieties are showing up and you just learn these things. And that's something that in discovery, you really need to be identifying early on and then have a company wide approach to holding, not holding hands, but yeah, kind of really reaching out to the customer to make that success achievable. And most importantly, ask them what their contributions are to that success because I believe in challenger customer success. There should be a book written just like challenger sales. We've got to have tough conversations because it's a two way street to drive anything to happen with, with SaaS offer. That's why we, we, we came, we partnered up with one of, uh, with uh, Anita Toth and came out with a having difficult conversations workshop. It's so, it's, it's just, it's important. It's yeah. got to be, you can, you cannot be in customer success and not be able to have difficult conversations. Right? You've got to you've got to be able to have difficult conversations in this role. Yeah. Absolutely, because if you're too friendly, it causes um, you know wandering towards capricious goals, right? And uh, you might end up with uh, use cases that you might not be able to achieve. Yeah. Capricious. That was a good word drop. <laughs> <laughs> that is yeah. It was it was it was correctly used. I'm a. <laughs> Okay. Pressed, <laughs> you, you've you've stepped things up since the last time. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for uh, thanks for the question, Alejandro. Um, got another one here uh, from Jasmine. Jasmine asks, "What are some strategies or approaches that can help customers buy in to long term, three to five year strategic vision?" for adoption and expansion when they're effectively in the trough of disillusionment. 
mm-hmm. uh, plus have a new CSM. I think she, she's probably thinking of, <laughs> of one account in particular. Uh, they were likely sold that idea and have little to no faith about the CSM's ability to execute, which I'd argue makes them less likely to be a true partner. Mm, yeah, that's a tough, that's a tough situation. Anybody have a suggestion for Jasmine? Thoughts? Sometimes turning around a bad situation can just be about saying I mentioned before, getting getting to a value, getting to some value rather than the full value. And sometimes it involves really just turning one person inside of the organization, finding somebody that's open to having that change, even if you've recently disappointed them, the team, et cetera. And some of that comes down just to the psychology that I actually see each of us using in this, um, you know, as we're on the screen, right? It's the, it's the way that we talk. It's the, the gestures that we use. It's the, the calming backgrounds we may have and being able to go and allay that person's fears in a one on <laughs> in a one on one meeting to to change that tide and then you know build the chorus. Right, that's a great point, Josh. I think I actually think if you've got a customer in that situation, having as a new CSM, you actually have a bit of an opportunity. Hey, I'm new here, right? But you need to show up to that first freaking meeting. If you're able to get one with the I'm new here, completely prepared, totally dialed in with a plan, right? Or uh, asking the right questions, not having them repeat. I mean, you have to show up dialed in, right? Because if they're already disillusioned, oh yeah, they're just going to throw another lackey at us. Now you got to show up completely dialed in with the plan. Here's what I think we should do. Here's what I think, here's a success plan for you. Uh, and and here here's the the next desired outcome from what I understand where you show I mean, you show up with all sorts of stuff and just and 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 potentially even catch them off guard. Oh wow, we didn't expect you guys to actually have your shit together because you haven't. And I think and you call it out. Start, you know. Yes. Yeah. I think you got to call it out. This is a reset. Yeah. This is yeah. a pivot to where we're headed now, because I think it's okay to call out that things haven't been where they need to be. It's oh, okay you've to got to own that. You've got to own that as a company for sure. And I think that the executive sponsor on your side is probably the one to deliver that message. Yes. And then with a set cadence follow-up to say, look, our bad on this, right? We, we are not happy. You're not happy with this, right? Here's what we're going to do. Here's your plan, right? Here's your new CSM. And then I'm going to meet with you personally yeah. every month for the next six months. And we're tracking this. We're going to track this together. And, and course correct. Yeah. If there's a big enough customer for sure. Yeah. hundred percent. One, one thing that I've done in the past to with just with the trough of disillusionment, I think every solution has a potential trough of disillusionment for almost every customer and calling that out in the kickoff as a risk point, but also sometimes a known point, right? Like it was really tough and internet of things. Like we put all this effort in and then like the first products would roll off the line, but it's only like, you know, like hundred products that would sell the first month or something like that. And it's like, well, big deal. What's the big deal, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah, like, yeah. 12, 18 months to get the volumes up to where you're actually going to care about it, but just know this is coming, right? It's a long game where we're playing. It was one of our biggest innovations on the customer success side was to set that expectation right immediately. Yeah. I like that, Mike. Surprise. Yeah, I do too. I've never heard the trophic disillusionment um, described as part of the customer journey. <laughs> uh, I've, I've heard it described in, in, in career terms uh, where you hit that trough of disillusionment. I hit mine in my, I don't know, about year 10. Um, awesome. Uh, so Jasmine, good luck with that. Yeah. You know, get, get some, uh, Mike makes great point, get some support from your executives, you know, and as Laura, Laura and Josh mentioned, you know, show up, show up prepared, you know, this is a reset, uh, and uh, and but just show up with a plan, 
right? Don't don't show up and uh, so what do you want to do? Right? <laughs> you got to show up, <laughs> show up with a plan. Uh, let's see. Diana asks, uh, what do you think a new CSM should do to make that first contact with customers as successful as possible? Show up with a plan. I mean, yeah. we, we talked about that. <laughs> right. It's you know, uh, I I, uh, I wrote an uh, an article on what makes a good CSM. Um, if we could go and add that to the uh, to the chat, but we've touched on several of these things. Um, one that we touched on early on was empathy. Um, we've overall, you know, talked about it over and over again. Mike, you have, you know, Laura, you have, which is uh, you know the relationships. And that's what we're doing. But one of the items is uh, having a pithy plan, right? And making sure that it's at least something that you can communicate clearly and still has built-in flexibility. So that way you can uh, you know, alter it as the conversation needs. It's on the handoff. So Josh, all of that, and then plus the handoff, the, the transfer information so that someone can be prepared and... Um, sales being a part of that. I think there's a lot of trust built with the sales team starting out and um, that should be naturally continued and, and that handoff. Um, and that can be literally both on the call. That could be sometimes digitally done, but either way, there's got to be clear whether it's email, phone call, Zoom, something that shows cases that the customer is feeling from the company continuity. Continuity? I have no Continuity. Yeah. There we go. I was like, that didn't come out right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's true. Exactly. The worst thing you can do is show up ask, asking the same questions that they've already answered. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You need to show up knowing everything that we know as a company about that customer. You know, right. And you're not asking, you're, you're, you're validating what you know, right. Which are the things that, 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 that we, that have been shared with us to ensure that those things are still accurate. And then, you know, by asking good questions, you're able to uncover things or discover things that you know you don't know, right? So peeling back that onion, I need to go deeper in these these areas. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and, and that uh, potentially, if you do it right, people open up, then they'll start telling you things that you didn't know you didn't know. Yes, I'm quoting Chris Voss again in his book, Never Split the Difference. Total fanboy. You know, and next next webinar, I'm going to show up with a with a T-shirt with his face on it or something. But it's true. It's, it's so important that uh, you know that you're asking the right questions. You're showing up prepared. Um, I, I, you got anything else, Josh, Mike, Laura, for Diana? That that balance of showing what you what your plan is, right? Yeah. Clarifying what your role is and what everybody's role is around the table and then doing a lot of questions and, and answers and, and setting that expectation that the customer, it should come prepared to, to talk a little bit, right? Like this is going to be an interactive thing that that's it. Right. Don't, you don't need to go over your skis on anything, right? Like you don't need to be the expert on things that you are not in your realm. Right. Just don't wing it. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Diana. Uh, Bob asks, can a company scale empathy? You touched on this, Josh, and I know you want to jump in here. Are automation and empathy at odds? No, I, I don't think they are. Um, and you need to, this is a more into that psychology. There's something that I kind of call meaningful ambiguity. Right, where I'm able to at least understand the persona with whom I'm speaking to in that you know, uh, customer marketing engagement uh, in that automation, whatever it might be, and make statements that they can feel uh, relate to them and uh, let them go and build those connections to it, at, even though it was uh, a fully templated message. Yeah. Bad, bad automation is not empathetic, right? Good automation can be at least set up the stage for empathy. Yeah. And if empathy is putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, that 
should be your goal, right? From a health score standpoint, how do you, what success mean for the customer? How do you measure that and put a health score around that so that you can at least dashboard indicators of their attitude? But it's, yeah, that's a tough one. That's a great question, by the way. I think that is the question for the next five years in customer success. Well, and what I like about this question is the question of empathy and customer success in general, because if you take it a higher level, is that it has to be actionable. And so how do we create actionable automation that empathizes and puts, I guess, in our customer shoes as well as, and so I think we're training our people and teams and hiring for that because I think too, uh, too much empathy takes us to the wrong direction in relationship with our customers. Um, but at the same time, I, my favorite example of a software I really love is Grammarly. And there are, they, they send me updates and I never talk to a person, but I feel like I'm in a relationship with that company because they're telling me about myself. Actually, they're giving me a human element of, Hey, did you know you could improve your communications and your, um, your grammar by doing these X, Y things, here's how you're performing. And so I think there's ways to do it, but I think more importantly, what I like about Grammarly is it's giving me actionable insights of here's how I'm benchmarking, but here's where I need to head to actually improve. And that's, I think the interesting cross-section for when we're doing human to human contact or whether we add automation. Automated empathy. Interesting. Now, and, and uh, Alexis, I, I noticed in the chat, Alexis asked a question and it's related to this. Can someone with low EQ become a good CSM, right? How do you effectively teach these human nuances situations and new hires? I mean, it's, it's, that's a, it, somebody with a low EQ, that's going to, it's going to be tougher for them. It really is. I, I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I, I think I, the question is why would, why do you need to hire somebody with a low, a low EQ? Yeah. Sometimes the case can be that they need to come from a very specific background. So you, you can't find the unicorn. Right. right. And, in, and in that case, that's when you need multiple roles, right? Or more, more technical. See it. Right. A more technical, maybe more technical, right. maybe an expert in something. Exactly. I'm expecting to be an ex- a massive, deep technical person to be very empathetic very, very, and have a high EQ, like not going to work. Good luck with that. Like, Doesn't work. <laughs> you know, like, good luck. I mean, you Doesn't can. Work. No, no, no. They, they do exist. Yeah. But they are they are unicorns, right? And you can't hire at scale for that. No. So it's best if you're running into that situation, split the role. Yeah. Have your expert, and then have your your high EQ person, and they're just managing more accounts, right? They they just have broader coverage between the, the the two of them. I've worked with some really brilliant technical minds throughout my career that I would never leave in a room with a customer alone. Yeah. I they 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 knew they knew their stuff. They were there, and the reason they were there, and the reason we hired them, was to understand the technical intricacies of the product, not to be, you know, the touchy feely, warm, empathetic, right? That's what my job was for. Yeah. So I agree with you. You got to split the roles. I think, uh, sorry, I just want to chime in one more thing. So I've tried to do that conversion a bunch of times. I've like had the hope, but this comes down to being our best selves. Right. And like, you can't take somebody fundamentally is one way and expect them to change 80%, 60%, 40%, that 10 to 20% to be their best self. What is their best self, right? And it's, if you have a low EQ, not as If their best self is a low EQ, they might might have a role somewhere on your team or in your organization, but it's not empathizing with customers and making people feel good about themselves. Yeah. And they may not even want that role. Like, to be honest, to, to have own that much responsibility and have KPIs on that, I don't see that lining up either. I, I, I would question. I would question. Why do you, <laughs> you have no EQ? Why would you want this role? <laughs> right? That's painful. You're, you're probably the most uncaring person on this floor. I don't understand why you want this role. And if they have a low EQ, you probably can be that direct with them on that. <laughs> you could. You're not you like you're gonna, I'm going to empathize with you and realize that you really don't care what I have to say to you. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
let's see here oh yes and by the way we do go uh, 15 past the hour so uh but if we uh run out of questions here we'll we'll end early um uh deep asks in continuation to diana's question who should lead the conversation would it be a good idea to go with your sales counterpart as a new csm to the customer i i i definitely i think that csm needs to jump in i mean what better time, right? My, my, I, I the, sa- the salesperson could introduce the CSM, uh, but if you want to build up some credibility and start to establish that trusted advisor relationship with your customer, don't have the crutch of a salesperson there, yeah. right? Maybe have them there to introduce you and that's it, right? Yeah. But that CS person needs to own it, right? You, This is the person who's going to be responsible for owning you guys achieving value, but we're going to have somebody, you know, run this session doesn't doesn't work for me sometimes that customer success manager handoff can actually occur before the sale yeah no no doubt this would be at a strategic customer for those special reasons but especially when dealing with enterprises that are getting ready to make a large purchase part of their concern in the sales process is will you get actual adoption so i don't spend a million dollars on shelfware and Part of that is showing up, as we've talked about, with a plan and being able to say, the salesperson saying, hey, you know, here's your, your CSM. She's going to go and, and take you, you know, all the way through the, the, uh, the process, uh, adoption, you know, technical implementation. She can handle it all. You have a great person building in uh, that confidence, setting her or him up for success to be able to go and manage that, allaying those fears and getting started. Well, it's this philosophy of uh, that we actually teach now of outcome-based selling and getting, getting customer success engaged in the sales cycle, later stages, yeah. uh, setting the stage, exactly what you said. It also so it's, up to sell beyond the sale because yeah. the conversation is not, will I purchase? The conversation is, what will it look like after I've purchased? And just to jump in here, we all hope that that actually happens, but sometimes people's ownership or their incentives aren't in line. And I think it's really important if you're on this call, if you're a leader of a team or you're a CSM, getting that alignment at the top of what are roles, what are the values they're bringing to the table? And it's not just who owns what, I think that can get very, very, who owns the client that can cause a lot of argument and debate. But what's most important is who is responsible for that event, that milestone and that experience. and then deliverables, but that really has to be an organization conversation between sales. If there's an onboarding team, um, include the CS, include the renewal so that that's clear because oftentimes a CSM, I can totally see saying, well, that, that's not actually what happens. Or I try to make this happen, but it's not job of CSM to set the entire strategy for the account team. It's a, it, it, it's a I, that ideally that happens, but it doesn't always. Yeah, that was actually Katie's question. In those enterprise sales, how do you get the salesperson to exit and let your CSM drive that relationship <laughs> for, forward? So you, you, yeah, I mean, it, it is, you know, swim lanes. You know, yeah. what, what is the, what, what is, what is, you know, who owns what, when, where? Having that all laid out, making sure it's a nice, smooth transition. Um, rules of engagement moving forward. You know, if customer success now owns that customer, okay, then you need to funnel your request through the customer success manager so they can act as a gatekeeper. But yeah, that's the key is it needs to be that discussion. The decision needs to be done at, at, at the, your, the leadership levels of your organization. Mm-hmm. Yep. 100% agree. I, think, I do think employing some of the psychology though, with your strategic enterprise sales person yes. is key too, right? Yeah. What does success mean? How are we going to get there? How are you going to benefit from that success? We're all going to take credit for it, right? Like, yeah, it's the same thing. You got to do the same thing that you would go, 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 go hunt. Yeah. Did everybody freeze? Nope. Just your beautiful face. (laughs) 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 No one screenshot this one. (laughs) We got better. (laughs) Let's look at the next question. Let's see. 
in training for a complicated product, how do you determine how much information you give them and when you want the customer to use the product and not feel overwhelmed, but also have what they need? Yeah. Who wants to answer that? <laughs> I'm Andrew Marks, by the way. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll definitely jump in uh, on this one because that was part of the, uh, the work that we did, for example, with CloudSpring, which is we said, hey, in 90 seconds, we can go and get you some, uh, some value, some experience. The unboxing, uh, Laura, that you brought up before, right? You're getting, um, you're getting that value, you're understanding, you're moving forward. And that's one of these things that um, I think is, uh, is, is so important, um, is that you're having these little wins and you can put them together um, in paths and, and just bring them from waypoint to waypoint in their journey uh, without overwhelming them with the other hundred things that your product can do. I think in the pre-sales process or er, very early on also doing a discovery assessment with the customer, like an open book discovery assessment. Hey, one of the, I mean, that's a playbook item that you just need to implement, but look, where I'm going to ask you, 30 questions, or you're going to fill this survey out. Based on that, we're going to determine the level of depth that we're trying to go on our, on our training. And then we're going to prescribe a program. And that first meeting, though, besides the discovery, as you mentioned, that, that quick win, like it's a taste, right? You're going to give them a taste and a plan, but don't overwhelm them in the very first meeting, even if they want it. And that's the thing. A lot of customers will say, no, 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 no. I want to do the full day training. It's like, okay, let's do an intro, let's set expectation, let that digest, then roll the program out. Yeah. And just to be specific <clears throat> around when I think about systems and the complexity of getting started there, I think there's that high level view that you give of here's what the first, if you want to do it 30, 60, 90, it depends on your product. Um, you can give that with the high level milestones, but then to keep from that overwhelming feeling, you close with, here's what we're doing this week, or here's what you need to deliver um, in the next 48 hours, whatever that is. I think when you end with not this big picture, you want to end with something very specific of next steps. That's how you start breaking it up and getting a customer to align along what sometimes can be a, a massive project plan aligning with your platform. That's why we, we encourage people to use success plans exactly. to move you closer. I mean, it's, it's a set of shorter milestones that move you closer to achieving that desired outcome, do it in, in pieces and stages. Yeah. And, and Laura, you, you know, now you've, you've brought this up a, a couple of times, which is a, a, a fantastic point to drive in, which is what is that call to action, Right. Let's, you know, and this is how we can uh, uh, scale empathy, um, you know, scale, you know, the, the psychology uh, of scaling, which is if I'm trying to get you to do something, what is the one thing I can do? And then, of course, lining up uh, kind of a almost a choose your own adventure, but we're getting them somewhere, as uh, Andrew, as you said, as a playbook, get them to that point, single call to action, and keep going and adding them to get them where both of you want to be. I love the choose your own adventure. They were great books and still are. <laughs> um, sorry, I disappeared there for a second. Um, so it looks like you guys, uh, y'all answered Rhiannon's yep. question. Yeah. There. All right. Awesome. Thank you for continuing that while we figured out our technical issue. Um, we got, look, we got one more question and we're almost done here. So, uh, Let's get this one answered for, uh, for Stephanie. Um, sometimes I find myself to be too empathetic to the customer thinking, yeah, that part of our system isn't good enough. Any suggestions on a balanced approach phrasing between empathizing with the customer while still protecting brand reputation value and not giving away too much power? I have experienced customers that try to really pounce on to a CSM's empathy as negotiating tactic even when highlighting the wins, as Laura referred to. I can relate to this one. I remember being a CSM, being in the same position, Stephanie. I, th I think all of us probably can. <laughs> this is really tough. My tact on this one, uh, but I'd love to hear Laura and Josh on this, is I talk about focus. 
right? So prioritization within the product. Hey, look, we're really good at this. This is an area that hasn't been in focus. And then I shift and say, do you think it should? Like, would you make a different decision, right? So bring them on our side of the table, right? Hey, look, yeah, we're really good at space, but we're really not great at reporting, for example. Like, do you think, like, would you, do you think we should shift that and engage them in a conversation? But you're always the positive of the, the solution and the negative. And then also a lot of times when a customer digs into this, they're outside of your core use cases. And that's a really thing to identify. You may not tell them directly, but that's when you need to put a communication plan because we have something that was probably missold, right? They're trying to use something. They're like, hey, your you know, reporting system doesn't go down to the nth degree. Well, that's like, that's actually not our solution. We focus on this piece. So they're outside of the ideal customer profile, right. which is creating, there's an expectations that, that has been set or they've set themselves. Yes. And we got to be careful on that. I mean, you, that's where you got to be really careful. It's okay to talk about overall broad company focus and things like that and try and gather their feedback, but don't, don't be like, no, that's not what we do. You know, we put a sophisticated plan in place probably with your CS leader. Josh, Laura, uh, you want to weigh in on this? You know, I was just going to you know, uh, kind of crack a joke. Um, you know, I'm from Washington, D.C., and, uh, you know, one of the things we talk about, uh, what a politician is, is they can uh, tell you to go to hell and have you look forward to the trip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so when we, when we uh, look at this from the customer success point of view, you know, we, we have to be... Um, you know, more collaborative than that, for sure. Um, but we also um, benefit from agreeing on that success criteria that we can solidly deliver, right? We're, we're giving them the chance to do it our way, to get to these uh, waypoints, to fit in our use cases that we do well before having to, hopefully not, but engage in uh, these custom uh, use cases that fit their specific reporting needs, for example, and uh, as you'd said, Mike. Laura, anything to add before we wrap up? My favorite thing, at least in the world I am, is that the ability of technology and what we can do today, people didn't have yesterday at your customer. So yeah. oftentimes, and then once they have it, their expectations are very high. And so that feels very challenging as a CSM. I empathize with your situation because we, as um, Mike and Joseph, Josh have alluded to, we've all been there. So I would just say that I think there's a lot of reality that comes to a conversation that says, here's our investment, here's our roadmap, here's our customer base and how they're using our product. And this is where we're focusing. And I really, I think I can just echo what Mike said and about um, aligning with how does this fit where you're headed and how can we have you a part of this conversation? Um, but I think it's okay to actually say, here's our strengths and here are areas we're improving and, and here's why. Um, because I think there's nothing wrong to actually say that something might not be up to speed across every element of your platform or product, because of course your product's continuously improving and ideally having massive up updates throughout the year. So that conversation should be had and, and that's okay. That transparency is important. Yeah. And it also continues to build that, build up your relationship. So all great suggestions. All right, we're at the end of our webinar. I think it went well, but it's not what I think. It's what all of you think. So please let us know by posting your feedback on LinkedIn and tagging any of us, success coaching, whatever. I want to thank my amazing panel of guests for spending time with us today, as well as our prep call. Uh, we all very, very much appreciate you making the time you're scheduled to provide your insights and best practices that you shared. Um, one final note, great CS leaders, know that they don't have all the answers, but they know where to get them. That's why we created the CS Leadership Roundtable to harness the knowledge and experience of the community to help improve everyone. So we hope you got something out of this discussion and we'll see you at our next event on November 10th when we'll be talking about building a CS team in a startup. Once again, check out successcoaching.co to find out more and sign up until we see you again. Have a great rest of your day, week and month. Stay safe and stay healthy, everyone.